Hello and welcome back. And that's right, you know it's been nearly three years since the particularly large, at least in the terms of the NAS world, Deadbolt ransomware attack of QNAP, Acer Store, and TerraMaster. Anyone that follows this channel will know that I will periodically bring up the subject of Deadbolt whenever I'm talking about these three brands. The reason being that during the course of those attacks way back at the start of January 2022, I highlighted that although these brands may make changes to their software and indeed their hardware in some cases, it has to be said that people need to remember this. The brand and the way they work when they are impacted by security vulnerabilities that are found by third parties, both for good and for bad, needs to be acted upon and brands need to be held to account. But three years on, it has to be said that there comes a point where I've got to stop talking about it because these brands have to be given at least to a point the benefit of the doubt. So that's what this video is. Three years on from Deadbolt, I'm going to talk about what Deadbolt is, how these brands are affected, the impact and the repercussions of it, recovery, and finally, what these brands have done in those three years afterwards to try to not only win you and your data back, but moreover, to stop something like that happening again. And after this, I'll probably stop talking about Deadbolt long term. But for now, let's talk about what exactly Deadbolt was. Deadbolt, or the Deadbolt Ransomware Group, were the organization of hackers who managed to remotely access thousands upon thousands of NAS devices remotely, and then from there, orchestrate a zipping up of the data inside the volumes of your systems, effectively creating a secondary pile there and deleting the original data and leaving nothing but a small notepad document with the means to pay a ransom. It even changed in many cases the graphical user interface to log into your system where all you could do was utilize a little payment key there that was your place to provide a Bitcoin payment and then in exchange getting a decryption code in order to get back your data. Unlike a virus or many malwares that are designed to make your system inoperable or completely inaccessible, a ransomware like this, or in most cases any kind of ransomware really, is designed to still allow you to access the system but not access your data and therefore have to pay them in order to get it back. It all started in January 2022 when the website census.io reported that there were 130,000 QNAP devices in a susceptible state remotely to this malware. From there, they reported that 4,900 devices were in, showing signs of either small or large scale impact of a ransomware attack, and that was eventually downgraded to 3,927, showing meaningful signs of attack. And again, that varied. Moving on to February, from February, then Acer Store was impacted. Unfortunately, both TerraMaster and Acer Store don't actually have public numbers that we can see for the sheer scope of impacted devices. And in March, QNAP was impacted again with a further 1,146 devices reported by census.io to be showing signs of impact of deadbolt. Bring in TerraMaster there midway through March, who they themselves were impacted. Somewhere in the region of 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 Bitcoin, they were being asked to pay for that decryption code uh, per device, which again could retail somewhere between $500 to $1,000. Um, but they also extended an invitation to the brands themselves, QNAP being the most prominent example, where they were told if they paid five Bitcoins, then they would get the details on how the, imp how the attack was staged, and if they paid 50 Bitcoins, and all of this was detailed on the uh, exchange to GUI, the graphical user interface there on the QNAP NAS, if they paid 50 Bitcoins, they would not only show them how it was done, but provide them with the universal decryptor there, something that the brands didn't engage with. So how did Deadbolt, the group, manage to inject that line of code? Where was the gap in the fence? Well, depending on which brand you're looking at, there was actually numerous different smoking guns floating around. And although some more than others have been highlighted across the internet, it has to be said that all of them probably added up and played their part. Some of them, such as admin credentials being enabled by default and not disabled so a user could disable the admin super user account but it was enabled by default also on top of that 
Um, when you set these devices up for remote access and you're accessing via their own relay servers, all three of these brands, by default, when you did set up remote access, also opened up ports on your router. There was an option that it will allow it to make it easy. And that was extended to the user during the setup, when really, it should have been off by default. And at best, an option they could have taken afterwards if they chose. Then you had third party applications that during the installation process via their app centers were invited to open ports remotely to make it easy. Again, a huge no-no. Alongside uh, admin accounts being on, there was nowhere near strong enough presets on passwords. Again, numbers, characters. And I know these things don't stop hackers, but they can make the hacking brute force process take considerably longer. None of these things were defaults. They were available as configurable options, but they weren't a default on the system. And that meant that when it comes to brute force hacking, then it's just a question of time. The same goes with ports on these devices. When you're setting these devices up for the first time, even on the local area network, you are invited to give the system a port. Having the remote IP or the local IP isn't enough. You have to have the port correct as well. 8080, 8000, 5000, it all differs. And a user wasn't invited to randomize that port. It meant that lots of users that followed the installation wizard with ease all had the same port, thereby significantly narrowing the attack surface there, or at the very least, narrowing the brute force time. Finally, two-step authentication, something that is still not a preset that you have to have on these devices, but in all three cases, adding two-factor authentication, one-time passcodes, MFA, multi-factor authentication, that kind of stuff, um, two-factor, all of it together was available on all three brands, but it wasn't a default and it wasn't presented to the user during setup. So most users never instated it down the line. Now, there is talk online, particularly in the case of QNAP, that there was talk of hard-coded admin credentials. And although I found a lot of information online about that, I couldn't find completely concrete 100% confirmation that that was the case. I got as far as 1995, but I'm not prepared to say that that was definitely the case, but it looked like it was based on lots of people's shared perspectives and user accounts online. All of this added up to a lot of users not having access to their data. So let's talk about the recovery over the course of those nearly three years. Well, all three brands did roll out their own uh, recovery steps that users could take. They're all very keen to say, update your system, all very keen to say that you can, you know, const uh, institute new security measures afterwards, but that's very much cart horse issues. Now, the, there were third party tools such as PhotoRex, such as RStudio, and ones like QNAP were going ahead with QRecover, which was an amalgamation of those that would allow you to use uh, standard data recovery services on drives inside the system to pull older data from the drives that are on there. Because remember, as mentioned, when you were, when the uh, deadbolt ransomware was taking place, it deleted the data, sure, but first it went ahead and zipped it all up in that very specific compression format, that encrypted format, before deleting that data. So it meant that in some cases, and depending on the capacity we're talking about and the size of the drives, the data was still there and it meant that you could go in via photo and video recovery tools that are available on the internet and standard data recovery many of which we talked about already on the channel to roll back the drives um to those layers and pull it onto an external enclosure it was slow the uh, percentage of recovery wasn't great i've heard some reports as low as 10 some as high as 80 but not a lot i would say um and overall, it still required a lot of overhead and, in many cases, spending more on the equipment for some users, depending on their capacity, than just paying the ransom. And that's not me saying that you should pay. You definitely, definitely shouldn't. But a lot of users were left with a tough decision there to either spend 500 to a grand on a recovery key or spend two to five grand on a large-scale storage recovery unit. Of course, some users had backups in place. Of course they did, and you bloody well should. For those users, it was just a case of reinstating an old backup and maybe losing a few hours, a few days of data, which, although not great, is still not the end of the world compared to some other users being impacted. 
Also, some users were heavily reliant on snapshots on their systems. Snapshots are when over time periodically data in a certain folder is snapshotted. A blueprint is created and then changes over time are documented. It allows you to cycle back through time on those images and it saves a lot more space compared with the wholesale backup to reinstate data. But snapshots were not foolproof in the case of everyone when it was coming to the deadbolt attack. Number one, some users had the snapshot stored in exactly the same volume as the original data, which depending on the file system and the way data was laid out in some cases, particularly in older revisions of the firmware, it didn't make a difference because all it did was rip through the snapshot images the same way it did with all the rest of the data. Next, in some cases, Deadbolt changed the user's interface into the system and stopped them being able to get into the user interface to reinstate snapshots there. Again, there were workarounds, but some users were reluctant because that portal was the only way they thought they could get that encryption key if they paid. And in many cases, ransomware will disable certain apps and services in the background anyway. And although I couldn't find any concrete reports of that with Deadbolt, it sounds like something they would have implemented anyway. And finally, when it comes to snapshots, some users just quite simply did not have the frequency in place to enjoy the benefits of a snapshot. Maybe their restoration, they had snapshots happening every week because they could only store so many snapshots in retention that would have been overwritten. Consequently... They, the data they created, say, in the last week was lost, which for them may have been mission critical. But there was some good news along the way. 155 users who were impacted by Deadbolt managed to get their decryption keys for free. How did they do it? Well, that's thanks to the Danish police, Interpol, and Responders.nu. Working together with those impacted users that reported it, 90% of uh, impacted uh, users who reported it to the Danish police managed to take advantage of a delay that's built into the payment system on the blockchain there. Long story short, what would happen is uh, they would make a payment to Deadbolt, which would then go into the blockchain, and then the response came through with their decryption key. But because of the time delay in terms of the payment going through, it afforded the Danish police a small amount of time to cancel the transaction and therefore get the key without the money changing hands. Of course, Deadbolt became wise to this pretty quickly and now double authentication is required on those. Although it didn't help everyone, 155 people, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 Bitcoins per payment. It's a nice story at least. Which brings us to what exactly have these brands done to win back your trust, win back your data? Now, QNAP was the one that was arguably the most impacted, and I would argue they're the ones that have probably done the most. But I would also say they've still not done everything, but we'll get onto that in a moment. The things that QNAP have implemented in QTS 5 and QTS 5.1 in the last just shy of three years were as follows. Number one, obviously they disabled the hell out of that admin account. That was rule number one. Silly, silly, silly. Next up, they redefined how security updates are applied to the system. So rather than just there's a new update, do you want to install it automatically or not? They went ahead and kind of broke it down into subcategories where you can choose to only have security updates and none of the other stuff because a lot of users and i'm talking to you mr mac user with the update on the top of the screen some users just hate to install updates because it might break something it might get rid of all your tabs it might do one of a million things that annoys you this allowed the system to only have to do that for security updates which let's face it are the most important also they disabled upnp for, uh, port forwarding being built into that remote access via my QNAP cloud. So again, that was one of those very silly things that enabling that remote access to QNAP services also opened the door to other users. It also enforces HTTPS encryption on those remote access ports. So if you're not using an HTTPS link, uh, connection in your browser to access it remotely, you're not getting in. Then there was alert built into the notification system for multi-file changes. This is really important because when it comes to getting impacted by ransomware, remember, it isn't a human coordinator doing this. It's a line of code they're hoping to do the job. So one of the notification alerts they strengthened was when the system is changing multiple files 
all of a sudden. Really unusual behavior, stuff like that. They also enforced multi-factor authentication, uh, one-time password, uh, taking advantage of 2FA and rolled out their own uh, two-step uh, two authenticator, as well as allowing broader use of third-party two-factor authentication tools. They also rolled out the security counselor, which rolls in uh, anti-malware, a system networks um, security scanner, and a firewall built into a single interface that you can configure to your own priorities there. So again, they did implement those changes and there are plenty of tools now that you can use to scan your system periodically, but also make sure that the system is in a non-accessible state if you want it to be. On top of that, they have done stuff externally, notwithstanding engagement uh, with further pen testing on their systems and security. They also rolled into things like Pwn to Own, something that Synology has been doing for years, which is when white hat hackers are invited to break our system for payment. Now, it has to be said that Aces Door and Terramaster did not implement all of these things. They implemented, I would say, 90% of them, but not all of them. But they also added their own. So there's the standard stuff, like not allowing UPnP override um, on your remote access, using their own stuff, disabling of the admin account there, uh, granular uh, updates, that sort of stuff. All of those things, and strengthening of the security scanners internally, but in the case of Acer Store, Acer Store really revisited all of the first time setup options on their system. So when you set out for the first time, if you are trying to put the system in an unsafe state, it'll warn you every single time you go for no redundancy, which I know is nothing to do with ransomware technically. If you want to set up default ports, if you want to use a weak password, if you want to enable the admin account, if you want to enable remote access, all of these things are disabled by default. And if you want to put them in an unsafe state, it will red alert you and say, are you absolutely sure this is risky? On top of that, Acer Store was one of the earliest brands to implement on an EXT4 and BTRFS platform support of write once read many. Right once read many is one of the mainstay protection points against deadbolt. If you have a volume in right once read many, it means that you can have data that is accessible and someone can try to clone it into a big archive zip to try and blackmail you or get money out of you. But at the same time, they can't on right once read many because you can't delete the original data unless you've got admin credentials or the sufficient period of time has passed that you've set it in. Now, moving over to TerraMaster, TerraMaster has right once read many, they call it Hyperworm. Um, on top of that, they integrated an isolation mode. Isolation mode is a one-click option in the security panel that allows you to, in one click, not only completely disable remote access, but it also disables all non TerraMaster certified applications as well as those utilizing third party uh, Java, taking advantage of third party Python, just the works. It enabled you to one click disable all of those. Also, of course, they went ahead and strengthened all the defaults and warnings across the system. And although they have integrated Worm and TerraMaster have integrated Worm, it has to be said that QNAP has still yet to integrate Write Once Read Many on their EXT4 platform. They have it on the ZFS1 QUTS, and they have it on the QES platform, but not on the EXT4 system set. These three brands have made changes. They have integrated new security pro protocol. They've instigated new defaults and changed a lot of their internal settings there. Should we let them off? No, of course we shouldn't. They all, in their own small or large way, dropped the ball. Users were responsible to a point when it comes to not having backups in place. You bloody well should. They should have been more managing of their remote access. But a lot of the options that were presented to them that they were being told were the right choices were not anywhere near as right as they should have been. So there is blame everywhere. So I'm going to stop talking about Deadbolt here on the channel for a while. And when I need to, I'm going to point at this video. Now, hopefully, I'm never going to need to make a video like this again. And hopefully, these three brands have learnt a thing or ten. Apart from that, thank you so much for watching. There's links in the description to everything I've spoke about today. And I'll see you next time.